Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Stan Boyger. Stan is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in political economy and public finance. Stan joins us today to discuss his co-authored proposal to save American businesses and American jobs, as well as his thoughts on how the Europe is handling the crisis. Stan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I'm very excited. I'm a fan of your work. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thanks for coming on the show because you've written a really fascinating piece with Stephen Hamilton of George Washington University, a very practical, rubber-meets-the-road approach to saving businesses and jobs as we work our way through this crisis. And I want to learn a little little bit more about you for our listeners. Tell us what you do and what your job is like and, and how it's prepared you for this moment. For sure. So I am uh, I'm an economist at a think tank. The think tank is the American Enterprise Institute. So what I do is a mix of academic work and then, you know, your more typical uh, think tank activities. So that includes some blogging, radio and TV interviews, briefing policymakers, you know, that, that basically the whole spectrum of, of, of activities that you associate with 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 people at, at think tanks based in D.C. So, you know, pretty uh, close to a lot of federal policymaking. And then uh, I occasionally teach as well. I uh, The past few years, I've taught half a public finance class at Harvard. And in the spring, I do uh, two weeks of teaching at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Um, though I, I imagine this year that will happen uh, from my basement here over the <laughs> internet. Oh, wow. So you're going to still attempt to teach uh, your class in Europe, huh? I think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, otherwise <laughs> otherwise, someone else will have to do it for me. Fair you enough. Know, like, yeah, fair that's enough. That's kind of how it goes. Um, but so, yeah, so that's the type of activities. And now where my fields in graduate school were public sector economics and international economics. And so I think both are uh, very directly relevant to policymaking, especially public finance, I think, in the, in the moment we're in. Obviously, because of the fact that I've been at a, at a think tank ever since I finished my PhD as opposed to in an economics department. I, you know, it's my day job to think a little more about policy. And so I think that's, that's been helpful in, in, in jumping in now that we have this pandemic that I think none of us was particularly prepared for, uh, or, you know, that none of us had really thought about that much, I think, until uh, maybe a few weeks ago in, in terms of the policy response, you know, beyond the usual, you know, there are negative externalities from infectious diseases. And you yep. know, that, that, that level of analysis, I think, is, is where, where many of us started. Yes, this is a situation that I never would have imagined in my life to have occurred and let alone prepared for in terms of thinking of models, maybe, or, or recessions. This is very different, a different beast. And I, I'm wondering, how do you view it is it going to be worse than the Great Recession or just different? And you know, do we have the tools in place to deal with it? Well, I do. I, I, I'm a little concerned that it's that the initial hit is going to be as deep, if not deeper, than the, the original hit in the Great Recession. Okay. I think in the, the recent experience with the Great Recession will hopefully come in somewhat handy. I think we're seeing people willing to consider much more aggressive action, especially elected officials who I think uh, 10 years ago were very hesitant to innovate and to to take dramatic actions that they wouldn't have, that, you know, that were different from what you normally do uh, throughout a regular business cycle, uh, which I guess we, we will never have again. But, you know, you people are very worried about, about deficit spending, about looser fiscal policy, about innovative monetary policy. Yep. Uh, and I think... The, the fact that sort of on balance people looking back now think that we were too hesitant and, and too restrictive in the measures we took in, in 08, 09, 10, 11, I, I think helps a little bit right now in that I, I think there's a realization that we, we should try to uh, step in immediately, that a lot of the trouble you can get into is driven by, by debt overhang and by long lingering unemployment um, and that you know, that we need to, from day one, try to keep those problems from arising again. Yeah, well, along those lines, are you surprised how quickly 
everyone. I mean, Republicans and Democrats have just jumped on board on being as aggressive as possible. I mean, we, we see talk now of direct cash transfers to households, huge deficits, kind of an all hands on deck, a war footing of sorts to fight this pandemic. Are you surprised how quickly everyone's converged to that point? Yeah, so I was getting really concerned to a week ago when nothing yep. was really happening and we had known that this was going to come at least for a few weeks. And I don't think, well, I, mean, I, guess, I guess that's still true today, but I don't think we produced a single additional mask or ventilator. And the, even the, the bill that passed the House on uh, just on this past Friday was very narrowly focused on, you know, pushing some money to the states and then uh, some, you know, paid leave and paying for testing. You know, no, no, no macro level response at all. But that's that's really changed over the past week. I think what what helps a lot, in addition to the recent experience with the financial crisis and the and the Great Recession, is just that people's lived experience is entirely different, right? Uh, obviously, a lot of policymakers, a lot of economists live in 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 cities or in in areas where uh, restaurants are closed, bars are closed, lots of universities and other sort of white collar work environments have shifted to to online work, and I, I think that that really helps people realize how dramatic the the situation is, and I think it also helps people, uh, you know, accept a little faster how big the uh, the initial shock to to economic activity uh, will turn out to be once we once we get some data. Yeah, this is going to be. It's the once in a lifetime event. Again, it's it's a complete stopping of our economy, something I've never seen before. And I wonder if there's going to be a V shaped kind of recovery or V shaped nature to this. So we we hit the brakes, we fall down real far, but we bounce up, you know, proportionally on the other side. Or is there a possibility that some kind of hysteresis kicks in because this is such a big drop? Um, any thoughts along those lines? Yeah, so that's where I think policy really comes into play, because I agree with you that it's extremely likely we'll have this massive drop off. But I think that with the th- with the wrong policy response, it's very easy to, to turn that into a, sort of a midterm, long term problem as opposed okay. to something more V-shaped. Yeah, so I think the initial shock is huge. But obviously, you know, there are big chunks of the economy that are not doing anything. And then people will say, well, you know, look. The restaurant will still be there. We'll still be able to buy the ingredients. The parking garage is still sitting there. That's obviously not how the individual entrepreneur and the individual worker uh, will operate. Right? People have right. bills to pay, and people have savings that will be that they will have to draw down uh, pretty rapidly if 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 entire industries close down for you know even two months, which I think at this point is is a you know kind of a good case scenario. I don't think anyone is really counting on. Uh, as going back to normal in mid-May, uh, and so I, I think it's pretty easy to, for for such a for such a big shock to to turn into a long-term one. Right? If you, we'll get, we're going to see mass layoffs unless we take dramatic action very soon, and you know those firm worker linkages aren't just going to be restored the moment uh, things go, is slow to go back to normal. And so I, I I agree with you that the shock is tremendous and certainly different than anything we've seen. Also, because there, you know, there's intentionality to it that obviously didn't exist. For example, in the Great Recession, right? We're we're going out of our way to not engage in certain activities. That makes it different. But I think that the whether we have a sharp recovery or a much more drawn out process is really going to depend on on the policy measures we take now. And by now, I mean really in the next few weeks uh, or even the next few days. Yeah, and that's a nice segue into your proposal, Stephen Hamilton. And uh, I think like many people, our our focus has been sharpened very much by the growing awareness of how severe this is. I want to switch to that now. And the the title of your proposal, your plan, is How to Help American Businesses Endure and Job Survive. I want to read the first two paragraphs, and then we'll go into the kind of step-by-step points that you suggest for policy. So this is what you say. The scale of the crisis facing small and medium-sized businesses in America is unprecedented. Consumer demand is collapsing to protect the health of all Americans. State and local governments across the U.S. have forced the immediate closure of hundreds of thousands of American businesses. These closures will cost millions of Americans their jobs and livelihoods. 
The basis of our plan is straightforward. If every small and medium-sized business in America was supported by the federal government to retain their workforce through the crisis, much of its economic impact would disappear. The government should provide immediate funding for emergency loans to any small and medium-sized business in America. And then you go through the criteria and how these loans would work. So walk us through kind of the outline of this proposal. Yeah, so the, the basic idea is, is, is simple. We, we want the federal government to step in and, and fill the revenue plug for, for these firms that, are, that have suddenly basically stopped functioning or that, have, that are going through massive revenue losses. Um, the idea is to do that through loans, loans that are conditional upon uh, those firms maintaining their payroll, right? And so that way we think we can both keep these otherwise entirely viable firms uh, afloat and we can channel lots of financial support to the workers at those firms, which are the workers that actually need money right now. And so the, the idea is to try and target households that are particularly vulnerable is right now I just, you know, what do I need? I need a pair of sweatpants and a hoodie and then I sit in my basement. You know, like <laughs> it's hard for me to spend yeah. more money. So, you know, you want to target the people who who uh, have currently lost their jobs, especially because no one's going to be hiring, certainly not in the interest, industries they, they're coming from, but probably also not in other ones. And, you know, a thousand bucks a month is nice, you know, as a, as a check they receive without doing anything for it. But obviously it's not going to cut it for, for people who've, who, are, who are entirely unemployed. And so the idea is to, to use their employers to channel money to them. And at the same time, uh, maintain those those worker business linkages, keep the entrepreneurs in a position to, to continue running their businesses um, and not not create the sort of loss of firm specific human capital and debt overhang that you would otherwise you would otherwise get. Obviously this is very drastic, right? We're basically right. saying, okay, you get these loans that cover your your full revenue losses or at least your you know a, a large percentage of your revenue losses. But the hope is that if we can get the public health threat under control relatively soon, this only needs to go for for a few months. Um, and then after that, we can really bounce back quickly because, you know, all of our pre-existing businesses and, and industries are, are in place to, to start producing goods and services again. Alternatively, of course, if the crisis persists for more for much longer, this will, you know, at least give people a safety net to deal with the original shock and, and you know, as it becomes clearer that the, the situation, uh, the public health situation does not improve rapidly, uh, it should allow people time to think about what to do next as well. Right. Now, you propose, if I understand correctly, that the Federal Reserve would be a big part of this response, that somehow they would finance these businesses on the ground, keep them effectively running, keep their payrolls going even if they're not doing the, the regular activity. Is that right? Yeah, so the idea is to have the, the, to use the regular financial industry, right? Just use people's regular lenders to provide these loans, but have some sort of uh, federal government backing. And so one way to okay. do it is you could have the Federal Reserve uh, buy up the loans, right? Once they've been originated. We're not super wedded to to this mechanism, uh, and I think there are many others that you could you could consider. So this would be loans going to small and medium sized businesses, and your local bank, maybe your local credit union, your local financial intermediator, whatever it is, gets backstopped by the Federal Reserve. Correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, could you make loans also available to just households if they needed it? You could do that. I think businesses have more frequently have so pre-existing lines of credit that they okay that are used to tapping uh, I also think that this this is a little more targeted than than if we were to provide these loans to, to households okay. because it, it, it'll only be attractive to firms that lose revenue because the backstop that we have on the firm side is that if you participate in this program your 2020 net income is not to not allowed to exceed a certain percentage that we're, you know, not specific about of your net income last year or in previous years, right? Okay. So if you can operate as usual, it's not attractive to enroll in the program because you, you're you capped in your, in your net income. 
Uh, whereas if you enroll in the program, you know, you you obviously have the benefit of the of the potentially forgivable loans, but your net income is kept. For households, I I don't I don't really know how we would would go about it. I mean, obviously you can lend money to people, but the lending part is not the in, in a sense, not the helpful part, because that way you right. just create debt overhang. Right. Whereas here in this program, so if you maintain your full payroll, ultimately the, the loans will be forgiven. Yeah, maybe the direct cash transfers that the president's talking about is a better way to deal with the household. But with the businesses, That's right. That's exactly. you exactly. do this type of lending. But I like your idea because it uses the existing infrastructure on the ground already. So one of the challenges of doing you know funding to small and medium-sized businesses, well, how do you get it to them? And it'd be almost impossible for the federal government, even the Federal Reserve itself, to get enough people, buildings, you know, infrastructure in place to do that. So just use the existing banks and financial firms we have out there because they're already on the front lines. They're already engaged and just use them. So I, I think in any of these responses we think through, lots of great ideas, but we've got to think through infrastructure constraints. So even like the helicopter money or the direct cash transfer the president's talking about, I just read an article today that there's a there's a trade off between getting everyone the money accurately and getting it timely. So you want to get the money as soon as you can to the household, so that people who are beginning to lose their jobs can still pay bills and feed themselves. But if you rush the money out too quickly, because the IRS simply can't handle this this new heavy load, there might be a lot of errors. Someone might not get a check, or maybe someone gets two checks. And so you you've got to deal with infrastructure constraints, and I think you guys wrestle with that in your plan. That's right. And so there are there's, there's a few somewhat comparable plans out there. One of them is by Saez and Piketty. Uh, I, I don't think that they have an implementation program as such. Uh, Senator Collins from Maine has a has a plan as well. And so she does not go through the uh, the, the Federal Reserve route as such, but she also relies on the existing financial industry. Uh, infrastructure that we have, and so I, I do think that you you need to do that. It's hard to think how else you would uh, you would get money uh, to them. So in her case, the loans would be forgiven uh, after a certain period of time. Uh, they would follow the model of, of sort of normal small business administration loans. Um, in our proposal, we talk about tax credits, right? So that would give uh, the IRS. I guess oversight authority and make sure that the conditionality is met, and it would also give people a little more time to 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 get their house in order. Um, but I, you know, so you have different ways to implement this. But I do think what you're saying is correct that you can't just try to mount up a whole new administrative agency right. uh, to do this, and it's hard, I think, for the for the Federal Reserve banks or for Treasury to to. Uh, I mean, I, it's hard to even picture how they would do it. Like would would businesses start sending them applications and then right, no. they, they would, you know, like how many people would they have to, you know, the, the it's a Herculean the, task. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And even if, even in, in normal times, it'd be a Herculean task, but even more so today when most of the government employees are at home, they're not together. I mean, you can't easily hire and, and, you know, and, and increase your payroll by bringing more people on board quickly just because it's hard to do that. In this environment, so you've got to use existing infrastructure in place. So that's, I think, a, a compelling point for your plan. You know, Stan, as we're sitting here talking about this, though, I am a little taken back, just kind of stepping back. How much you and I—we both come from, you know, more free market leaning institutions, but how we're all in on this, right? And if you had this conversation maybe a month ago with us, we might think very differently because it, it, again, it's hard to have seen this coming and and the scope of it, but. In, in your experience, I guess what I want to ask this question is, have you found that the political differences have faded? I mean, we, we touched on this earlier, but you know, people who normally would be you know, against doing something like this, this much intervention, are they much more open now? I mean, do you find anyone still holding back, resisting out of you know, principles or concerns? I think that among, among economists, I think that everyone is, you know, reasonably on the same page that pretty yeah. dramatic action is needed. I think there the divide is more about between people who think that what we need to do is prop up aggregate demand, you know, and almost exclusively focus on that versus people. Uh, and I guess that includes Stephen and me, who are more worried, too, about, you know, keeping the, the supply side intact. I, I do want to emphasize that that divide 
is not one that lines up with your typical, you know, collectivist slash free market spectrum. I don't think. I think both approaches ha- have support sort of across the the political or ideological uh, spectrum. The Keynesian approach, I think, has support, for example, from my colleague Michael Strain, who has been on your show uh, at least to some extent, but also from from Claudia, who's obviously on the on the left. Whereas this approach, I think, I'm at AI, so it's the sort of center right. Uh, uh, Susan Collins, obviously, you know, center right senator, but I think Bernie Sanders has tweeted a couple hours ago, uh, you know, sort of thoughts along the same lines. Uh, you know, and he obviously he's very committed to the to Chavismo. I think the 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 divides that you would have seen a decade ago are, are have dissipated at, at least within the the uh, community of economists. More among uh, elected officials. So, well, I mentioned Bernie. He he is very open to to something that is not just writing checks to people, right, but providing support to businesses, which surprised me a little bit because among the more you know, among elected officials are more sort of, you know, quasi-political policy types. Uh, at first, I think we saw, we did see some pushback against the idea of not just writing checks to people. Um, but I, I think that's slowly dissipating on the left. On the right, we have, I think, seen a willingness to, to spend a ton of money uh, in ways that were inconceivable 10 years ago. Now, I some of that obviously is that Republicans are if I have control of the White House, and I think that usually makes it more attractive to people to spend money, but but it's still pretty stunning. Like the things you've right. seen from from someone like Mitt Romney, who uh, you know who ran for president on his uh, makers and takers divide, right? Uh, is is uh, you know, that feels like it's hundreds of years ago, but years ago, but so he's been very open to this. So has Senator Cotton. So the White House itself, of course. Uh, as is talked about a, a trillion dollar package, and so the you know I think really across the board you see a willingness to to engage in aggressive action. And again, I think that that goes back both to the experience of the financial crisis, but also just people's day to day lived experience of 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 how uh, pervasive the effects already are. Yeah, and I think again what you're doing is great because it's it is looking closely at the supply side. You know, story, and maybe it's easier for many economists, many lay people, politicians to fall back on a more demand story, just because we know we understand that it's easier. It's firsthand. You know, people want to spend; they need their money. That's right. And so, I, th- I do think that's it, it's been more dominant. I think. Sorry, I, I, I no. Go ahead. I was listing all these people, and I, I think it's that, that actually that narr- you're right that that narrative is more common among the more policy oriented, more politics oriented. But it's folks. easier to understand. I think. I yes. Just, I mean, it's it's hard for many people who don't run businesses or maybe engage to think through all the the concrete steps, all the problems that can emerge. So it's good, I think, to to complement both both perspectives. I think complement each other. In fact, here's the way I would frame it. I mean, this is obviously a big, big supply shot to the global economy. But the way I like to look at this is, we still want to stabilize household incomes and business incomes because they have committed themselves to a number of financial contracts. And even though we're going to be poor in real terms, there's no need to add to the pain by forcing businesses to go under, by forcing households to go under. Just you keep them able to make their, their their dollar obligations that they've signed, and in the process, you minimize the spillover effects. And so, I think what I see you doing is you're you're preserving the supply side, or I, from a different angle, you're preserving business income. And I think what the Direct cash transfers are doing are preserving household incomes, and you need for sure. Though, though, to be clear, obviously, a lot of the money that would go into a program like this would end up being paid out as as wages. Oh, good point. Uh, right. So this plan also does offer uh, relief there, and in a sense, it's very it's it's targeted at the most vulnerable households because these are the people who would otherwise be losing their jobs or see their hours hours reduced. So, so I, I think we and we try to be explicit when we write about this that we do think it's very important to to provide relief to households as well, exactly for the reasons that you're you're pointing out. But a lot of that would would come directly from this program. I, I do think you have to target to some extent, right? Because there's 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 no way to get enough money to the people who really need it if you if you provide the same sums to to every person or every household. Yeah, 
Absolutely. This yeah. has to be a multi-fronted approach. You know, you've, you've got to, again, approach this like a war. This is something very serious, so all hands on deck. And I encourage... Yeah, and so one, one additional plank is yeah. obviously on the financial system side. And that, I mean, I imagine you have, you have thoughts on what the, what the Fed has done so far. Um, but yep. I think that, that keeping sort of the credit side of the economy uh, yes. somewhat functional is, is, is sort of the third Absolutely. big economic plank, I'd say. Yeah, no. So the, your 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 proposal is looking narrowly, or I say narrowly, it's focused in on the supply side in terms of businesses, non financial firm businesses. The uh, direct cash transfers the household, but yeah, you still got to also maintain that financial sector, and and the Fed is doing that. Al- although I have some suggestions for them, I'll, I'll throw them out here since since you bring it up. Um, the Fed is beginning to open up its alphabet soup of liquidity facilities again, as you know, commercial paper facility, primary dealer facility. And before we know it, money market facility might be a big in because the president had mentioned that. And these all, you know, in the fog of war might be what is needed. But it would be nice if there was a kind of a one-stop shopping facility. And and the standing repo facility, which has been talked about coming into this, it could have been up and running. It, it could have been designed to a, take a lot of collateral, a lot of counterparties. George Selgin at the Cato Institute is a great proposal to make it kind of like a one one unit, one one facility that could have provided all the liquidity needs of many different firms and using many different assets. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. We're in the fog of war right now, and so the Fed's doing what's appropriate given what it can do. But that, you're right, this is a multi-front approach or multi-front war. We need to be aggressive on all fronts. Now, I encourage our listeners to, to check out uh, Stan and Stephen's proposal. We'll provide a link to it. Any other uh, closing thoughts on this before we switch over to Europe? Um, well, I, I I do think it's important that you know obviously it, the we can't expect every everything to to work perfectly, but I do really think it's important that the federal government uh, starts taking some action because we we really haven't seen much yet. So on the on the economic front, obviously the Federal Reserve has done things, but Congress so far has really not passed anything. A, a couple of weeks ago, they I think they appropriated eight billion dollars for some emergency healthcare spending, but that's really the the very lowest hanging fruit. Uh, then the House has passed a bill that was kind of narrow uh, last week, but that that's really all that's happened. So the economic policy response so far has just been all super talk. limited. And we're, yeah, and look, but we're going to have such massive job losses so quickly, and we're we're not prepared for that at all. You know. Then in addition, of course, all of this is going to be futile, I think, or ultimately not not affordable, not sustainable, unless we get the public health threat under control. And we've made basically no progress there either, right? We're still not testing enough people. The Even announcements from the administration that were made two, two weeks ago turned out to just be wild overestimates of where we would be now in terms of testing. I don't think we've produced a single additional ventilator uh, since January. We are we're running out of facial masks, uh, you know, like all of those things. I mean, people keep saying, oh, during World War II, we produced so many B-52s or whatever the plane was. Sure, I buy it. But for now, we're not producing any of those things. Uh, and it, and we're, we're, you know, we're quite some time into this and things are not going to get any easier uh, once uh, more people start needing intensive care, once more people start uh, dying. So um, the, I think the sense of urgency is very important uh, as well. So we're not bending the curve as well as we could be. No, for sure. I don't, so I, mean, we, I don't know. Yeah, well, I do I mean, my part, but I just sit at home and I, you know, I go <laughs> doing on your part. and I watch Netflix. But, You're very patriotic <laughs> there watching Netflix, doing podcasts with people like me. Yes. That's right. No, but I, I hear you. So, I mean, part of bending the curve is social distancing, finding ways for people to stay at home, um, and then also upping the production of all the needed medical equipment. So, you know, if, if there's one thing I could say about that, this is a rich American tradition. We were slow to enter World War II. <laughs> we we're slow to do a lot of things in a timely fashion. And maybe it's just the nature of who we are, our, our government system. I don't know. But hopefully, again, this urgency is becoming more and more apparent each day. The, people's focus has been sharpened and, and laser-like on the fact that big, aggressive actions are needed. Okay, so... That's the U.S. front, and it's a very busy one, and we'll come back to this, I'm sure, in future shows. But let's switch our focus over to Europe. I know we have a bunch of listeners over there as well, 
And if anything, I think they are far worse off than we are. They definitely are the center of the pandemic right now, as the WHO has told us. So maybe give us an overview. What, what's over there? I mean, you're from the Netherlands, so you probably have really vested interest in following what's going on over there. But kind of paint a big picture for us. What's, what's happening over there? And, and how are the governments over there handling this crisis? Well, I would say, roughly speaking, and a good part of continental Europe is in, in almost complete lockdown by now. So that's true for Italy. It's true for Spain. It's true for France. It's true for Belgium. It's, it's becoming truer for the Netherlands. There are border controls now, even within the Schengen area, which is the sort of free, free, you know, no passport, no border checks, uh, part of the European Union. In some parts of Italy, we've seen very dramatic scenes in in hospitals, caseloads just going way beyond capacity. Um, I'm I'm a little worried that Spain is next on that front. In my hometown in the Netherlands, about a third of intensive care patients now are coronavirus. Patients, and that's really just you know that that's that those numbers are, are escalating day over day, and so the situation is pretty pretty dramatic. Governments are have stepped in a little more proactively uh, in the last few days than uh, in, in 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 previous days, including on the economic policy side. And so we've seen very dramatic packages in the Netherlands and in Denmark as well, where the government is effectively paying for the wages of employees at, at the most targeted firms. A uh, slightly different model from what we have proposed, but you know, a similar vein. Uh, in Spain and in France, you have a lot of emergency uh, support for households and firms and, and dramatic expansions of basically state-backed loans. Um, and so, we're, you know, the, the situation is not, is not great, but the, the response is pretty dramatic at this point. The, of course, the situation is in, is in intense flux and there are things happening right. constantly. Germany closed its, uh, closed its borders uh, to all countries a couple of hours ago. They, they had closed most of their borders in previous days. I think one big push that the commission, but also Angela Merkel is making is to keep trade flows going. Okay. Um, I think they came under pressure briefly uh, a few days ago, because obviously companies are not wild about sharing medical equipment, but in, uh, in other industries, it's holding, it's holding up okay. Uh, but yeah, there's obviously, you know, it, it, I, the way I think about it is that the the outbreak is just maybe a, a couple of weeks ahead of us, and so you, I think you see what's going to happen inevitably, in at least in parts of the U.S., which is that all bars and restaurants and uh, stores that are, you know, deemed non-essential are shut down. No people on the streets. You know, no flights. Very limited travel. Uber shuts down. You know, all those, all those things. And then, very aggressive economic policy response packages that would be, you know, would have been hard to imagine even two weeks ago. Well, Stan, that's a great overview of what's going on there. Maybe I shouldn't say it's great, but it's it's a fascinating overview of what's going on there. I have a several follow up questions. Um, And I'll start with maybe the least important ones and work up to more serious ones. But I've wondered, since Europeans tend to live in higher density areas than most Americans, if that plays into the fact that Europe is the center of the pandemic now, and maybe that has implications for us. Any thoughts? Well, I think that, so, I mean, obviously China has enormous mega cities that are extremely dense and, and, and it seems like many of them have been, have been spared. So I, I really don't think that density okay. is the issue here. I think the so delayed response and lack of social distancing is a problem. I think in, I think Italy is a, is a particularly old society. And so I've, given that a lot of the most severe cases and a lot of the deaths uh, appear to be concentrated among older people. I think that leads to just to an overload of the healthcare system a little more quickly than than uh, would happen okay. in other places. So maybe it's demographics more than density. Yeah, it's. I think it's it's demographics and uh, just the measures that people have taken. Right, uh, South Korea has Im- has enormous hyper dense cities as well, and That's has been point. able to keep the the threat under control. So I. So I, I wouldn't look at, at density as an explanatory factor. I think okay. the policy response and, and people's own commitment to social distancing, I think, is what, what, what really explains the difference. Okay. Well, let, me, let me ask another question. So I read just yesterday, I believe, that Euro- the Europeans are 
now more open, the Germans in particular are more open to issuing a joint European bond or a, a something equivalent to a treasury security, but from the from Europe, backed by all the regional governments. And there's been talk of this for a long time. Why doesn't Europe have its own safe asset? I mean, you do have German bonds, you do got Swiss bonds, but you don't have like a European wide one yet. So tell us about that. Is this really going to happen? Is, are we breaking through um, and making some progress on this front? The, the answer as to why it's um, why it hasn't happened so far is very straightforward, which is that voters in what we uh, usually call Northern Europe or the whatever the core the, during the crisis there was often this core and periphery. Time. Right, right. <laughs> oh, unfair. Uh, maybe, but it's just that voters there are worried about redistribution within the within the union, and they think, look, we can have these shared fiscal responsibilities, but ultimately uh, it's going to drive up interest payments relative to what we pay now, and we're going to end up paying for spending in 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 Southern Europe indirectly. Right? That's I think that's the I think the explanation is super straightforward. That's yep. It's mostly that uh, that political uh, pressure. That's of course separate from whether. Uh, it would be a good idea on you know your typical you know <laughs> welfare function maximization basis, and there I think the question is different. We've we've of course seen that the and and there the question is different in particular because uh, for for the countries that are within the eurozone, right, the countries that cannot set their own monetary policy, uh, which which includes a really big chunk of the European Union at this point, especially now that the United Kingdom has has left. I think there there's Certainly, something to be said for a more shared approach. Uh, again, it's politically difficult, and I, but I think that the current crisis op- actually offers a nice opportunity to experiment with it. Uh, you know, that's a very optimistic approach, I think, to the crisis. But obviously, every European Union member state is going to have to engage in dramatic fiscal expansion and new spending. And you know, for some countries, that'll be fine, and you know, markets will 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 accept that this is a temporary thing. But I think there's concern that. Uh, interest rates on on Italian and and Spanish debt will spike in a way that's extremely unhelpful because it'll you know under current rules it'll probably force them into some sort of austerity program and that's obviously the opposite of you know that's that's really not called for now because it's just a one time response to a crisis and they need to be able to deal with that so one thing you could envision uh, and one thing that I would like to see is an experiment with euro bonds where there is a you know joint liability vehicle that's issued to raise funding you know explicitly designated for dealing with this crisis right that way at least we we will hopefully be able to to get over this crisis without triggering uh, another sovereign debt crisis like we had after the financial crisis um, and so i think that that would be uh, a good way to deploy these euro bonds we can then also evaluate the experience uh, and see how comfortable governments in different member states are with it a couple of years down the road, and then you know, and then decide whether we want to make this an ongoing process. But I, I think that kind of one-time experience would be very valuable, and it would it may it, it would hopefully keep the recession in Europe uh, from becoming one that's super drawn out through those uh, debt channels. So, if there's a silver lining in this, one of them might be that this has opened the door. The the coronavirus crisis has opened the door in Europe to at least experiment with a joint European bond and. You know, right now it could be used to justify, based on what's going on the pandemic. But once you open that door, it may be hard to close it in the future. Or at least you might open it far more in the future and become something more regularly issued. Yeah, so that's the. I think that's the fear for a lot of, for a lot of voters, especially in the in the northern countries, right? Not just because, depending on how the branding works, right? It would be not just this, these transfers to, to to southern Europe through the interest. Rate channel, but also just the idea that there is now a separate source of financing for Europe-wide activities, in addition to direct contributions to the European uh, Union institutions. I think that would that would worry some politicians uh, and 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 voters, right? If 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 we have this new mechanism to raise money, what is going to keep the uh, the union from using it not just for emergency coronavirus policies, but also for your, you know, your agricultural subsidies and your structural subsidies and those kinds of um, those kinds of outlays. In terms of the financing costs, though, you know, given the whole safe asset shortage problem that was going on well before this crisis emerged, and you look at the yields on German bonds, on Swiss bonds, 
And it seems to me, at least, that for the foreseeable future, that a European bond could be issued with really low interest rates. Now, now maybe it'll be a very different story on the other side of this pandemic with huge budget deficits run up. But if, if the trend from before the crisis continues, it seems like Europe could actually issue bonds and simply you know, satiate part of the demand for safe assets. Yeah, I totally agree with you. When I uh, expressed those concerns earlier, I was, uh, I was 80% voicing the concerns of voters in Northern Europe and maybe 20% uh, expressing my own concerns. I agree with you that generally speaking, that seems like it would have been the likely scenario over the past few years, and it would be the likely scenario for the next few years as well. And so I, I'm not saying, I'm certainly not saying that those political concerns are necessarily justified. Okay, fair enough. All right, another question related to the European Union and the Eurozone, I guess, more particularly. We know in the U.S. case, going into the crisis, the U.S. economy was doing relatively well, relatively healthy. And President Trump makes this point, I think it's a fair one, that it's it's great to come into a crisis, you know, with, with you know, all for cylinders running, your your engine's hot, you're in great health, you're doing well. Um, but in Europe, what was the condition coming into this crisis, and, and does it matter? Well, the uh, the European economy was doing okay, obviously better than it had uh-huh. uh, since the uh, financial crisis, but it wasn't doing as well as the as the U.S. economy, right? So there were still a number of countries with high rates of unemployment. Uh, there were a few countries that were more constrained in their fiscal policies, either because of European rules or because of skepticism from from markets. Uh, the EU was struggling with the UK's departure from the European Union, and that's sucked up a lot of uh, policy energy and probably also had started harming growth a little bit already, especially in the UK itself, but probably also in the countries that are most directly connected with it economically. Um, in addition, there was a new migration crisis developing on the on the southern and southeastern border of the of the union, and so you know there were a number of problems. I think one thing that the EU made a lot of progress on since the crisis was on the on the banking supervision side, right, where where there is a little more a little more European over the oversight, and you know at least some notional preparation to deal with financial institutions that go under. Uh, and that are large. And then finally, I think the EU made some progress on on setting up sort of emergency intervention systems in in a situation like the current one, like the, the European Stability Mechanism, the those associated uh, funds in, in, in Luxembourg that allow for raising large amounts of funds relatively uh, quickly to to intervene in in emergencies, but obviously many of those institutions are were set up a bit on the fly and they haven't been tested thoroughly. And so it's a very different situation, I think, from from the U.S., where you you obviously have an OCC that has been around for a long time and a, you know Federal Reserve that has that just enjoys much more political leeway, I think, uh, than the than the ECB and those other institutions do in Europe. Okay. Now, I came across another proposal similar to yours in preparing for the show, but for the ECB, and it's called Throwing a COVID-19 Liquidity Lifeline, and, and the, the authors are Marcus Brunheimer, Ricardo Rice, Jean-Pierre Landau, Marco Pagano, and I apologize if I pronounced those names incorrectly, but they come up with something very similar to what you guys have proposed, you and Stephen proposed for the U.S., but the ECB extend some um, financing, some loans to businesses in the uh, Eurozone area and do so as a way to kind of keep things going, keep these businesses afloat through the crisis. They meet payrolls, meet their obligations. Is that something the ECB is talking about doing or can it even do it? I mean, I don't really see how the, I mean, as you know, first of all, their mandate is less uh, broad than that of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you know, it's a little farther removed from from the day to day banking system in the individual member states. Okay. For for non sort of Europe wide banks, all of the supervision is, in, in principle, done by the member states, the central banks, uh, and and other institutions. I also don't really see how that how that would fly politically. I mean, it was 
really a very heavy lift for the for the ECB, I think, to do what they did during the during the fallout from the financial crisis, where they they were lagging behind the Federal Reserve, I think, quite significantly, and yet they got tremendous pushback, especially from from Germany, and so it seems implausible that that will that that will happen, and that's why I think you need to go you know, more explicitly to the, to the fiscal route with, you know, some sort of joint debt instrument, you know, like Eurobonds or something through the ESM. So make it more explicit, more transparent than kind I of think, a backdoor yeah, I, approach yeah, to the ECB. Yeah. I yeah. think it's hard. I don't think the ECB enjoys the, the, the kind of, you know, gets the kind of discretion from the rest of the political system that the Fed gets uh, when it really comes down to it. I think that's that that would make it more complicated. No, I've heard it said the ECB is a more independent central bank than the Fed. Is that fair? I think it's more independent in the sense that it's that it's harder for politicians to tell it how to set interest rates. You know? Okay, um, but I, I I don't think it has the same political credibility that the Fed has. If you okay, so it really depends on how you think of independence, right? If you think of independence the way you know, sort of the the, the Rogoff style independent, uh, whatever conservative central banker papers look like, right? Where independence is basically defined as are you willing to raise unemployment rates? Uh, I think in that sense, the ECB is more independent. But in the sense of are you able to do whatever you want in outside of your core monetary policy responsibilities? I think the Federal Reserve is more independent. But uh, I mean, I, how do you how, how do you see those things? Well, I had Joe Gagnon on the show from the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and, and he made the case that there, it's independent. It actually has in its you know in its constitution or the laws written for it, yeah. um, the ability to do things that the Fed can't do. So it can do. He alleges it can do helicopter drops, which is really a backdoor way of doing fiscal policy. And it'd probably be the sum of all fears for Germans. Like, oh, we knew it. We knew they were going to do this. <laughs> you know, they're going to reallocate resources via, you know, different inflation rates, maybe in different countries um, and different real exchange rates as a consequence. Um, so on one hand, you, know, you, make, you can make the case that he does, at least legally, they can do more things. But I, I do think, I agree with your point. It's still a very political organization. Um, you still have representatives from all these different countries who are set on the board, the executive committee. And it's it's not... Like they're on an island somewhere making these decisions as academics. It definitely operates in a political environment. It's just that it's, it's more independent in terms of it doesn't report to Congress directly and, and on, on that dimension. Um, but you think it would be a hard sell politically for the ECB to do anything really drastic like extend loans to businesses or do helicopter drops? Yes, for sure. I, I mean, I... I mean, I, who knows how bad the situation will get right, right. We'll in see. a couple of weeks, you know? We'll but, get back together in a month and right, see how things right have now, changed. Because right a month ago, we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having now. Yeah, so. but, and especially relative to the Federal Reserve, I think. That's yeah, true. yeah. All right, Sam, we're getting near the end of the show here. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you have like a baseline forecast for how long this whole process will take off. I know there's a lot of uncertainty, but in your mind, do you have some like framework maybe – by July or August, that's what the president said, that worse would be over in the U.S. by then. Or do we just simply not know enough? I don't think we know enough. I don't think we know enough about the mortality of the virus. I don't think we know enough about the morbidity. I don't think we know enough about how it responds to warmer temperatures. Uh, and so I think it's very difficult to, to forecast. Now, uh, the way we have written our plan, the idea is obviously that you know, businesses and households just need cash to get through a few few difficult months. Um, if that turns out to be wrong, right? If this problem is going to persist for another uh, for another year, then I think the optimal policy changes dramatically as well. Right? Because at that point, people need to. Then we're just going to have fewer restaurants for a while, and you know, and fewer dry cleaners, and we don't need as much commercial real estate and. Instead, people will need to, they will need more people who work in delivery. We probably need to shift even more to, to, a, to a services industry because it's hard to, to do manufacturing when you can't get close to people, right? So we, we need, in a sense, we need more employment, but we would need more employment in, in, in all kinds of services and we would need to automate much more of our production of goods, right? So that, at that point, you, you don't want to keep people at their 
current uh, employers because suddenly that firm specific uh, human capital is just not as valuable anymore. And instead, we need to start thinking about a, a more a more structural transformation. So, so yeah, I I don't know. I, I I just find it difficult to tell. I don't think I don't think we have great information on the on how the public health threat will evolve because you know the the countries that are, in a sense have have gone through most of the process now they are not entirely back to 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 operating the way they used to operate. Um, and so you know the. I assume ultimately they will we'll have a vaccine of some kind, um, but a year is really very different from three months. I think in in just letting everyone basically Sit get paid home. by the by the <laughs> yeah. federal government. Yeah. Right. Well, let me try to paint an optimistic picture in closing, and then you can shoot it down. Okay. So I think on one hand we don't have. To the, be clear, I love the idea of an optimistic picture. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know, I know. But oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to create a baseline in my own mind. I'm not sure I can. And, and so here are the things I'm weighing. On one hand, I don't think we can do what China has done. I mean, China you know, is an authoritarian state. When, when people, once they got their act together, which took some time, they you know, took very concerted efforts. They would separate people from their families, sometimes forcibly put them in these quarantine areas. And they can probably do things that we can't. They also had some infrastructure in place from SARS and other pri- previous crises that allowed them to do it right. So you, if you look at their number of cases and you trust their data, they've they've kind of you know, hit the peak of their curve, and if anything, they're, they're leveled out. So I don't think we have the ability, given who we are as a country, or you know, our freedom-loving instinct, to really do a, a, the same kind of lockdown as them. And that's a strike against us, which in my mind means a longer process. On the other hand, I, I think of two positives we have going for us. Number one, we get to free ride off all the other people's suffering and all the other research that's been done and all the learning that's been done in China, South Korea, and Europe, all the labs that are working 24-7. And, and, and that, you know, is beneficial to us. We're kind of like the last part of the storm here. We get to see what others have done before us. Secondly, I, you know, American wherewithal. We have an amazing economy. We have, you know, cutting-edge innovators, researchers here working. And I've got to believe, you know, it's the American spirit here that will, will step up to the plate and deliver a home run for us when you know we're in the midst of a war, when times are hard. This is when we are at our best. And I think those two things, that what we've learned from previous countries and our ability to step up when times get tough, um, may shorten the horizon. But that has to be you know, offset against the first one, that it may be extended given our inability to really do a lockdown. So I, I certainly agree on the, on the second point. And as something you've seen people say is, look, uh, this is all a consequence of you know, we shouldn't have free trade and we shouldn't have immigration and we shouldn't have high density cities. And, you know, that all of those things combined just mean, OK, really, you think we'd be better off if we had, uh, you know, a couple more weeks to, to respond, but we'd be 40 percent poorer? <laughs> <laughs> right. Insane. right. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think we have a rough uh, road ahead of us, but uh, we'll make it through. And thanks to people like you and, and Steve, and hopefully we'll have good policies put in place to help carry us through the storm. Well, with that, our time is up. Stan Voiger has been our guest today. Stan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, David, thank you for having me on. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.